It's like a clown show. It's like it's, it's like it's. <laughs> Greetings and welcome to the Mount Rushmore podcast. My name is Jeff, and as always, I'm joined by my good friends Richard. Hello. And Michael. Howdy. Uh, Richard and Michael like to debate and deliberate the most ubiquitous aspects of uh, many different topics. And this week is uh, different uh, in which they uh, are going to be judged, not by myself, but by a good friend of the podcast and all around good guy and mensch. It's Mr. Alex Gradet. Woohoo! Oh, stop. No, it's true. <laughs> I'm great. I'm fantastic. <laughs> Uh, we've known Alex uh, for quite some time, and uh, I know him to be a knowledgeable raconteur and man about town about a lot mm -hmm. of different topics. And a, as a person who's uh, lived on in two of the places where the Beastie Boys have produced content. Oh, that going to segue to our topic, yeah. the Mount Rushmore <laughs> of pop culture references. Such a pro, in, Jeff. Such a pro. In Beastie Boys songs. Oh, my God. I did a spoiler within the intro, within the spoiler. I've, been, I've incepted our podcast. So, um, yes, the topic is the Mount Rushmore uh, of pop culture references in Beastie Boys songs. Uh, but the music aficionado who chose that topic is Richard, who's just chilling like a villain way back there. Why did yep. you choose the topic, Richard? Um, I, I, I think there was a Beastie Boys song, a song that came on that had a really obscure reference that I didn't realize. I didn't recognize. But I knew it was a pop culture reference. So I had to go scramble the Wikipedia to figure out what it was. And that just got me thinking about all of the different pop culture references that are buried inside Beastie Boys songs mm -hmm. and just how it's such a rich tapestry of random 70s TV shows and obscure jazz flautists and <laughs> Japanese baseball players and just what whatever happened to pop into their mind. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that that's such a wonderful element of the Beastie Boys music. It's kind of this like where's waldo spot all the different mm -hmm. references element to it which i've i've always appreciated judge alex gradette do you agree do you disagree uh i do um and there's uh i will recommend uh for further reading after you've uh listened to this episode absorb this episode what it's had to teach you let it wash over you uh there is a great uh av club article from about 12 years ago from right around the time that hot sauce committee part two would have come out uh that is a listing of uh here i've got it right here it is 170 beastie boys references explained and it is i genuinely recommend if you're going to enjoy the episode that's to follow please wait till afterward to consult this article because otherwise you're just defanging <laughs> whatever michael and richard have to say but uh but yeah it's it was i've been a fan of theirs since about since I was in the fifth grade, which is when License to Ill came out. And a lot of their references just sort of washed over me. Like they just kind of, they were just, they were just sort of, just sort of sounds like we, we just, oh, you just needed this name to, to fill in this line. It's like, oh, no, no, no. Those are actually all like, there's, there's a lot of uh, deep intertextuality going on uh, that once you start exploring it is, like Richard said, it's it's this real kaleidoscope of of seventies sitcoms and Japanese baseball players and uh, a lot of specific New York area stuff too. Um, that uh, it's it's kind of like, and the hit and run nature of it, it's sort of like a good version of like that Ready Player One thing of like, hey, I recognize that, but it's like it's 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 the better version of that. It's not just hey, here's a bunch of stuff we all know. Um, and I think it really rewards closer listening and just gets you onto that wavelength of even as their music got progressively ser more serious as the years went on, they never lost that sense of fun. And it comes through in these references. Sweet. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, let us know. Yeah. Send us that link and we'll post it in the show notes. And um, there's also that Beastie Boys book where they it's your link sounds like it's a much more concise. <laughs> it's not a full length <laughs> book. Uh but yeah, that, that book was a fun read because it gave a little bit of context behind some of the, the references and, and names and things like that. So, OK. All right. Yes, saw uh, Alex. Oh, yes, no, Jeff I was Alex. just going to add. Uh, yeah, I actually I, I can't recommend the Beastie Boys book enough, but also uh, it's not only worth owning the book to hold down your bookcase and keep it from flying away in the event of strong <laughs> winds. Uh, <laughs> The audiobook is fantastic because some of the segments are read by uh, are read by um, Ad Rock and Mike D, but they 
cast, literally all of their friends. You've got Amy Poehler, Bobby Cannavale, all of these great people who are huge Beastie Boys fans reading these whole uh, sections of the book. It's terrific. Oh, that's cool. That's something the Kindle version <laughs> didn't didn't have. Okay, Richard is uh, the person who chose the category, so Michael is the person who will start. Uh, go go for it, Michael. Sure, uh, Alex. Like you, um, I kind of grew up listening to uh, uh, "License to Ill" like just over and over. I uh, I, we, I mentioned it on one of our earlier episodes of like albums we listened to growing up, and definitely I consume this album as much as I consume chipmunk punk. And um, <laughs> uh, the thing that always stood out and the thing that I remember the most um, is their constant references from the first album to White Castle. And, mm -hmm. and they, they mentioned White Castle on uh, and some girls on Hold It Now, Hold It, on The New Style, on Slow and Low, on Slow Ride. And it's just like this pervasive thing that I really um, realized I started um, – uh, relating to in terms of how much I used to talk about kickball or uh, like, okay, mm -hmm. we get it. <laughs> you're, you're into this very regional um, burger chain. Um, I almost felt like, uh, uh, like I was uh, master shake complaining about the moon and nights. It's like, God, we get it. You guys talk about the moon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there with you. But um, in, in fairness, I think they were all about like 20 when it came out. And though, even though like, their their music always sounds like just bombing around New York, and it it just speaks of a very lived experience. Even before their time, they were twenty year old dudes, and um, you know, uh, probably White Castle weighed pretty heavy on their minds. It's funny too. It's like, like you said, like I didn't know what the hell White Castle was either. Like, <laughs> it was just a thing that they referenced. I had no idea it was a burger chain when I was, you know, seven years old or nine or whenever I was listening to this album over and over. It was just this thing that they kept saying, especially in, um, oh, uh, in Girls when they, you know, when they say from White Castle to the Nile, and the Nile was echoed on and on. But it's just like I have no idea what that is. Is that is that a <laughs> Is that a reference to some <laughs> literal castle in Egypt? But they don't call them castles. <laughs> they call them pyramids. So I'm I'm gonna be nine and I'll just be confused for a while. And that's fine. That's fine. Um, Was is, is that roughly the East Coast equivalent of if Tupac wouldn't have shut up about In and Out and all of his songs? <laughs> it's 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 probably in quality terms, it's probably closer to like uh, like if Tupac hadn't shut up about Fat Burger, but yes, it's the same idea. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy well, or something. What like that. I loved right, about yeah. that is I we had White Castle, um, and everybody knew it was the Drunk Dash. It was it was the late night thing, and they also knew that it was good for a little bit, and then you regretted it uh, pretty mm -hmm. soon. But <laughs> what I loved about say Run DMC and the Beastie Boys and some of the New York East Coast kind of rap is that it wasn't aggrandizing all the time <laughs> their lifestyle mm -hmm. it was it there was some real <laughs> some realness to it and mm -hmm. uh that was one thing that i thought was kind of fun like oh these guys are drinking shitty beer and eating shitty food and then they're having fun rapping about it and mm -hmm. that that was a fun aspect of that all right richard what do you got all right so my first one um i'm going and i just sort of went more off the top of the top of my head the ones that immediately i could think of that were like oh yeah that's one that every time i hear it it makes me smile or it makes me go oh yeah i get that kind of the captain america thing oh i get that reference mm. i get that reference um my, my first one is from the song sabotage and it's uh i'm buddy rich when i fly off the handle oh wow mm. i love it i love it and this is one that is again is kind of rewards you for being in the know for some obscure pop culture kind of paraphernalia or kind of oddities um for people who don't know buddy rich was this very famous jazz drummer maybe the most famous jazz drummer of what the mm. since gene krupa probably you might remember him from his epic uh drum uh drum off with animal on the muppet show mm. for example um, and he was also, along with being an incredible drummer, apparently an incredibly massive hothead. And one of his uh, trumpet players, or trombone players, I think it was, 
on one of his tours started secretly recording Buddy Rich after the performances coming back to the tour bus or the dressing room and just ripping into the band, just uh, just hurling invectives and abuse, <laughs> the likes of which no no musician making scale should have to deal with. And it became, the, these tapes eventually leaked and they were this underground sort of phenomenon among mm. kind of tape collectors of that sort of celebrity blooper sort of thing. I came I came to it later on, probably in the early 2000s. There was a collection of bloopers called Celebrities at Their Worst. And the Buddy Rich tapes were included in that. And it just blew me away. I mean, just the, the quality of the language. It, it, it takes a lot to be a master master swear and buddy rich <laughs> had the talent to do that to go all the way in this in the world of competitive swearing i guess <laughs> so but, so but I, sorry, just, well, I, just, I just say i just love the fact that they this reference came out years i think i, I want to mm -hmm. say years before the celebrities at their worst cds came out so they were just on the this is just something that was in the beastie boys world and they threw it out there assuming that 95% of the population isn't going to know Buddy Rich and Buddy Rich's temper. But for that 5% or that 3% or even that 1% who got it, they were going to go, oh my God, Buddy Rich, temper. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Alex, what were you going to say? I, uh, I, well, uh, uh, a few things. First of all, I talk a lot about how being, being a, a fan of almost anything in the 90s involved a lot of homework in a way that it doesn't today. And a great deal of what we're talking about today feeds into that because you've got like Michael's reference to like being in being in whatever grade and not knowing what White Castle was. Well, if that's the case today, you go on you go on Genius, you look up the lyrics of the thing, you click where it's great and it's like, oh, OK, that explains it for you. Um, but the Buddy Rich thing. I agree, Richard, that for the the whatever small percentage understood the reference, that's who that was there for. But it's also like for the obsessives, it was there to be like, wait, what does that mean? Who's Buddy Rich? What does it mean? He flies off the handle. And then next thing you know, you're tapped into this underground network of trading bootleg tapes of, um, of hot mic moments from celebrities. And speaking of which, actually, here's a funny, I'm going to bring this one back home again, because I'm glad you brought up Sabotage. It's sort of inevitable that a BC Boys podcast is going to bring up Sabotage. Sabotage is featured in the 2009 Star Trek movie, uh, which was sort of a fun, like, oh, classical music kind of thing, which for years I was like, okay, well, J.J. Abrams is like a known huge Beastie Boys fan. There are references to, to them in all of his work. That and it's a song everybody knows. Oh, it helps yeah. make this. It helps make this thing relatable. Beyond that, though, the reason why to pick sabotage is that, sh similar to Buddy Rich, Shatner has a famous hot mic moment when he was recording vocals for the Star Trek cartoon show, where he insisted on pronouncing the word that is the title of the song is sabotage, which with the short <laughs> a, and then he gets into a whole argument with the with the vo producer whoever's on the other side of the glass in the booth over you know you may say it's sabotage i say sabotage and it just it became this sort of cult thing stitched to the um stitched to the the pop culture fabric of star trek so when he's making the 2009 movie jj abrams gets to live at this intersection of i'm doing star trek i love the bc boys and then there's this in 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 inside baseball joke uh, that ties the word sabotage or sabotage back to back to Star <laughs> Trek. Uh, so speaking of metatextuality, there's that for you. Oh, that's a great that's a great connection. I think I made that cross over my brain, but didn't put it together. <laughs> that's so great. Okay, uh, yeah, Winfield. That's, that's a great jumping on point for uh, okay. my next reference, which is from the song um, Intergalactic, and uh, it's the reference to the pinch in the, from the neck. Uh, a Pinch in the Neck by Mr. Spock. Talking oh, awesome. About, um, Star Trek references. Uh, and a song that should have been in a Star Trek uh, movie. But of course, I, I don't know if it was, but I think Sabotage was played. Sabotage. I think Sabotage was played like, in every, in all three of the movies or in some weird way. Yeah. Um, but what I think is so funny about the Beastie Boys songs is so much of their uh, 
so many of his songs are about like writing the song or being involved in the song or like this boastfulness of like i'm here and i'm gonna kick your ass on the microphone and then here's a you know then ad rock comes in and he's does a version of like the same thing and they're all just kind of going around and then the song intergalactic has nothing to do with like space travel <laughs> it's just like a cool fun interesting word that they put in there and the rest of the song is just like well you know come at me i'm gonna i'm gonna get you and then uh i do like that there is like this you know space reference to to a vulcan but it's i i don't know like some of their songs are like about a specific thing and some are just like all right we're just gonna jump around a bunch and sing stuff that is uh, aggressive <laughs> unnecessarily as a so, video content producer, Alex, you might like that one part of Sabotage where they've clearly not cleared the, uh, there's something like, uh, there's like a watermark over the explosion of the car. <laughs> it, says, <laughs> it says something about footage not cleared or something like they just used the the low res clip. With oh, them. it's, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> what we could do, I mean, if you guys haven't already done a Mount Rushmore BC Boys videos, I mean, that's, that's in and of itself that's a whole that's a whole mm -hmm. thing but michael i'm glad that you're continuing the thread of the um of the star trek reboots and the bc boys relationship to them yes intergalactic feels like a slam dunk to put in there but there's a reason that it can't because and i've i have given far too much thought to this so so this. joke jokes <laughs> on you you've you you've just you've you've just engaged the wrong person on the wrong topic because <laughs> that the Spock reference in that song and though and Beastie Boys songs existing in Star Trek movies create a paradox because how could the Beastie Boys in the 1990s be writing about they're writing about a TV character when they're writing about it but in the Star Trek universe that is a real person so how could they be writing about this person hundreds of years before his birth? I'm so glad you didn't bother to ask me because <laughs> I'm going to answer you anyway. I have reasoned. So, so that's right there. You can't, it, it's too on the creatively. It's too on the nose to put it. I'm not following you at all. Wait, what are you talking What I'm talking saying is in okay, 1998. So Ant-Man Ant discovered time travel <laughs> and he had he yeah. threw it to, uh, 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 or he came up with no. the idea of it. Okay, go ahead. What I'm saying is, in 1998, the BC Boys write Intergalactic with a reference in it to Mr. Spock. But in the 23rd century of these Star Trek movies, Beastie Boys songs exist. But also yeah. existing in the 23rd century is oh. an actual Mr. Spock, not a yeah. TV character, but a person who mm -hmm. is friends with a starship captain who uh, loves the Beastie Boys. So... It stands to reason at some point in their meeting each other, Kirk would have been like, wait a minute, Mr. Spock, like in the Beastie Boys song? Um, yeah. <laughs> because it, it, it would be like, it would be like if Mozart had written an opera that referenced Barack Obama. It would be like, wait, how is that? That's what? Yeah. No. How? Yeah. But I figured out, a so, so it creates a paradox. It's it creatively. I'm JJ Abrams, and creatively, it's too on the nose to be like, we're going to put the Mr. Spock song in the movie with Mr. Spock. But then it also raises this question of how, like, how could this exist? I have gone down such a fucking rabbit hole on this. I hope this is a, a salty language permitted podcast because yeah, there's totally. no, no other way to explain the total waste of time that I've put into this. But I'm debuting my theory for you right here. No. Um, okay, so. Obviously, for Mr. Spock to be referenced in a song that exists, that then exists in the Star Trek universe, the BC Boys and Mr. Spock, the real Mr. Spock, not the TV character, would have had to have met. But how is that possible? I'm glad you didn't ask that either. Um, <laughs> in 1986, the Beastie Boys were touring Licensed to Ill. They were all over the country. They had... They had, I believe I've got this, I believe I've got this right. I'm going from memory. I don't know why I didn't bring my actual notes that exist with me. But I believe that they were touring different cities in California around the fall of 1986, which would put that, which could potentially put them in the Bay Area in November 1986, 
Love when this. Kirk and Spock <laughs> and the whole crew travel back in time to kidnap two humpback whales to save the future. Yes. And it also stands to reason <laughs> they could have been on the same city bus where Mr. Spock applies a pinch on the neck to knock out the punk with the boom box. Which, so yeah, what you didn't see is the punk was playing egg raid on Mojo before. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's very, Michael, very, very Michael aware of their, uh, <laughs> of their presence on the bot, and then you change it. Yeah. 12 years later, the Beastie Boys are still talking about this fucked up thing they saw on, on, on a BART bus in San Francisco in 1986, mm -hmm. where a guy just reached over, pinched another guy on the neck, and the first guy passed out. And they're like, I think, it, I think his buddy called him Mr. Spock. So we're going to write this into a song. Perfect. And that's how, that's how you <laughs> heal. That's how you heal the Beastie Boys Spock paradox. Bravo. Bravo. You know, uh, the judge is allowed to award themselves points in this. So, <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I think points for that. Yeah. I yeah. don't think anybody else is getting points on this one. All for me. Well, I'm going to talk about when Han Solo turned around and said, we didn't start the fire. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Always burning since the world was turning. <clears throat> okay, okay. So, uh, Richard, I think we should eschew halftime and bust on through to number uh, three from you. Wait, is that I'm right? still on number two. Sorry, okay. So, uh, eschew this. Wait, you're not on sab Sabotage. Was your number two? Wasn't your number two? No, that was my number one. Oh, God. Okay. Bust it out. What's your, what's your number two? All right. So, my second one is exploring the vast amounts of sports references oh, in Beastie Boys uh, songs. Whether you're talking about Dick Buckus or Mario Andretti, who gets referenced three different times in Beastie Boys songs, which is kind of weird. Um, or Cl Walt Clyde Frazier, the great Knicks point guard. But the one I'm going to go with is I got mad hits like I'm, mad, like I'm Rod Carew. Sweet. Um, because this finally brings us to our our natural connection point between the Beastie Boys and Adam Sandler. How do we connect these two titans of <laughs> entertainment? Of course. Well, they've both referenced Rod Carew in songs. So. Oh, sweet. Hall of Famer Rod Carew. Mm -hmm. With Rod, with the, you know, uh, for the Adam Sandler and uh, obviously the Beastie Boys with Rod Carew. Now, they sing made it. a very. Come on, sing it, man. Do your best, Adam Sandler. Oh, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, listen, not my first concert, but one of my first concerts was seeing Adam Sandler, uh, over at like the Gibson amphitheater. Uh, he nice. was very important to me as a, um, a child in 1996. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Um, now the Beastie Boys also made a very similar reference to Sadahara. Oh, the Japanese slugger, um, in a different song. The, the, the Rod Crew ones from Sure Shot. Um, but I like the Rod Crew one partially because it's more accurate. Rod Crew had more hits in his career than Sadahara O, even though Sadahara O was the international home run leader of all time, even more home runs than Barry Bonds or Babe Ruth or anybody. But in terms of just straight hits, Rod Crew was your man. More than 3,000 hits, just a guy who hit 300 every year. And his just kind of on that fringe of like being somebody that you most people have known if you know sports you know him if you know baseball you know him if you don't if you're of a certain age maybe you sort of remember the name and that's what makes i think an ideal beastie boys reference to that sort of like oh yeah that guy type of thing <laughs> love it uh i i so for those uh, sports hating people who sometimes uh, descend on our podcast, mm -hmm. uh, uh, D, D Brown, <laughs> is that, is that okay? uh, you're welcome back now to listening. Um, what are the other names? Uh, you said the, who were some other sports, sports ball people? Oh, let's see. I've got a list here actually uh, from medium. Someone came up with a list of nothing mm -hmm. but pop culture, nothing but sports references. Um, Shea Stadium, the Yankees, Phil Rizzuto, who else? Hawthorne Wingo, Dick Butkus, Bill Lambeer, Shaq, even though they don't call him Shaq Diesel, which is a little disappointing. Uh, Anthony Mason, the former Knicks thug. Um, lots of, lots of, lots of old school Knicks references. Sweet. Sweet. 
Uh, Michael, let's move on forward. What's your third? Sure. Uh, my third choice um, is a song. Hold on, let me pull it up. It is a song, uh, check it out, from the album to the Five Burrows. It's uh, Ad Rock singing a line where he says, I bring the shit that's beyond bizarre, like Miss Piggy. Who moi? And boy, does that do a lot of heavy lifting trying to rhyme bizarre with moi. And uh, what I really appreciate about the BC Boys is they they really stretch some of their rhymes. Uh, you know, you can sometimes get like and and then to kind of come together. But to get bizarre and to moi, I mean, it's just chef's kiss worth of just like. <laughs> okay, I, I can go with it because you sing it a little fast and then you do the Miss Piggy voice and there you go. I'm in. Uh, uh, check it out. It's one of my favorite songs of theirs just because uh, I think just the uh, it's ridiculous in that way. Um, I love that just the 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 uh, what's it called? Uh, the, the check check it out part is the, not the refrain. It's like the cool the, the hook. hook. The yeah, chord, the basically, chord. Mm -hmm. and um, it's just like a cavalcade. Even later in the song, uh, they start uh, uh, they make a reference to uh, uh, singing the, the the theme song to uh, oh, what's it called? What's the song? Those are the days, uh, Richard. Please, all in the family, all in the, all family. the family. And he even does a voice uh, like uh, what's her name singing it. And it's just so funny that like when they pulled this stuff together and how their individual brains work to cobble rhymes out of who knows what. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I just appreciate that, that effort that it's like this, they, they definitely think differently um, in terms of like how things are related. Alex is on the edge of his seat. Uh, yeah. Down. I mean, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sitting here the whole time and like everything is like, I, I, I feel like I'm treating my job on here like footnotes and I'm just like putting an asterisk on everything Michael's <laughs> saying like, oh, I'm going to say something about that. I'm going to say something about that. Love it. Love but, it. Well, uh, um, I, huge props for the Miss Piggy reference because it's actually for me, it is, it's a Piggy reference both in terms of content, but also form because they've got the who moi, which is very much a Miss Piggy line, but the line reading is like one of her karate yells. So, uh, <laughs> so it's, it's just kind of perfect. And, uh, and on top of that, uh, to the five boroughs is an album that's really dear to my heart for a bunch of reasons. It was, um, they were very firmly in their back in New York bag with that one. It was their first post nine 11 record. They hadn't made anything in they hadn't made anything since hello nasty which was six years earlier um and uh really came back strong a little bit of a different sound and i know that that in hindsight they've been a little bit critical of how it sounds that it, it doesn't have quite as much juice going to it but at the very least check it out is like a solid lead off uh single um and uh the um the thing I love about the record too, and this is this is very personal for me. Like I said, it was their post 9-11 record. They've got um, an open letter to NYC in there. They have a bunch of songs about unity and coming together, not in the sort of faux patriotic way that came about in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, but like in a real like, we need to get our shit back together. Um, it was very, it came out the summer before the 2004 election and had a lot of bad shit to say about George W. Bush. And it was really great to see these guys who had been sort of out of action uh, for a while come back with a very strong stance that I happened to agree with. It was nice to know that they were still the good guys, especially when a lot of pop culture figures were um, either staying out of it or uh, or just going with, going with the flow. Um, but... It's a record that hits home for me because the cover of it is that gorgeous, gorgeous line drawing by a guy named Matteo Pericoli. And immediately after 9-11, I had just gone through a breakup in late August of 2001. And my girlfriend and I, uh, my then recent ex and I, neither of us could afford the apartment that we were living in together on our own. So we had to find new places. That was in August. Uh, our lease was up in October. And um, I think you can all recall what happened in between. 
I happened to find an apartment uh, that was one of the best apartments I've ever lived in. Uh, it was this. It was a share in a loft with an artist who, unfortunately, she's she passed away nearly twenty years ago now. Her name was Gretchen Bender. She had lived in this loft. It was literally. It was on the water. It was uh, right by, right on the East River, right at the South Street Seaport, overlooking FDR Drive. And I got half. Uh, I got to use half of this massive loft uh and and share the space with Gretchen who was a really tremendous person it was a great place for a lot of personal rebirth and to kind of it was very close to ground zero so it was in some ways the best and worst place to process the trauma of what was going on and global trauma was kind of folded in with personal trauma there's a lot of trauma flying around in that uh in that particular fiscal quarter in the years that followed but a couple years later to the five borough to the five boroughs comes out and right there in that beautiful line drawing, if you go straight up from the U in Burroughs on the logo, you can find my apartment from immediately after 9-11. Oh, that's fun. Wow. <laughs> Which I I was I also remember right around the time Five Burroughs came out, I was dating a girl who was a huge BC Boys fan. And I told her this whole story, that this whole spiel I've just laid off you. She's like, that's pretty good. It's not like living in the Paul's Boutique building, but it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Is this in the gatefold, the open, or is this a right on it the cover? It is actually on the cover cover. Um, okay. It's uh, straight up from the U. You'll see there's like, um, like the U and the G are two corner buildings right there on the corner of South Street and John Street. Mine was the second one in. I'm on the third floor. Oh, awesome. That is, I don't live that there is... anymore. I have not just doxed <laughs> myself on your podcast. <laughs> That is super cool. Well, I, sh I should say that that was one of the reasons why I thought it'd be interesting to talk to you because you have one, one thing that the Beastie Boys book does talk about is their time in Los Feliz and kind of escaping New York for a while and and doing kind of what Steely Dan did, the kind of ping ponging from their from the New York thing to their L.A. thing. And and um, and you can see where, where the influences um are in each one of those and you've lived in both places also so mm. it, it was something i was going to request to you to kind of ask you were there any kind of personal connections um have it, having been a resident but uh, also another thing i want to ask you before we get too far into the podcast is mm. uh what's going on with alex these days is there anything fun you're working on anything you wanted to share with the audience who is listening. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, the last time I was on here, I had a podcast to Hawk. I do not have that podcast to Hawk anymore, uh, but I do have a new one coming up. I'm keeping it a little bit under wraps, but it's a deep dive on my favorite movie of all time. And it's called my favorite movie of all time. I will be releasing further information about that closer to, I've recorded a couple of episodes with um, some fun people that I'll be talking to. Uh, and um it's coming together really nicely. And if you uh, if you want to hear more from me, but I can't wait for a podcast every single month since uh, the start of 2015, I have released a monthly Spotify mix. Uh, all eight and a half years are available uh, over at steelapesessions.com. All one word. Cool. That's really awesome. Let's go check them out. I know I've been seeing you post links to them on social platforms, so it'll be fun to see them all curated in one spot cool 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 all right I, for one i'm looking forward to this podcast about the movie chud <laughs> about time somebody uh, did a deep dive on it how well you know me richard <laughs> i thought it was traveling pants i don't know uh, so uh this is how poorly i know our podcast so is it now richard's third it is my richard third. the third oh, richard oh, the third. my third yeah correct and my third one let's stick with uh Paul's Boutique, you mentioned it, um, and a, a uh, reference from the song Hey Ladies, be Tom Thumb, Tom Cushman, or Tom Foolery, date women on TV with the help of Chuck Woolery. <laughs> <laughs> and I like this one because I, from what I know of the Beastie Boys, kind of, I think collectively, you know, they were, they would, if I remember this correctly, they would keep, and Alex, jump in if I'm, if I'm, mm. if I'm, I'm getting my lore wrong, but they would keep like little and like a lot of rappers just keep lap notebooks of just like little snippets of raps, and then just like when they, something would pop, like a little rhyming couplet would pop into their head, or 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 a, like date women on TV with the help of Chuck Woolery, they would just write that down as something to come back to and see if they could work it into something later. 
And I just would love to know what the context was of how they started thinking about Chuck Woolery. <laughs> because I almost I can almost guarantee you what it was is they were drunk or stoned or something and were one morning at a recording studio and the only thing that was on TV was Love Connection. Yeah. Because people forget what a big show Love Connection was. What a weird <laughs> concept for a show. We're not you know, go on a date and then tell us about the date. We're not gonna send camera crews out to record the, the date. It's not going to be like blind date or anything like that. No, we're just going to have two regular people talking about their date. And most of the time it was boring as hell, unless Chuck Woolery was able to dig some sort of magic out of the date. And my mom watched this freaking show every <laughs> day. And everyone's mom watched it every day. And I don't know what that says about like what, you know, what what moms in the eighties were were pining for <laughs> if they they hadn't found the love connection in their personal lives that they had possibly hoped for I don't know but it was such a it, love connection is such a specific memory for me being an eighties kid that when I when you hear that on on uh, hey ladies it just automatically brings you back to a very specific place in time. Mm -hmm. Woolery, I, my Woolery oh, history goes back to New Zoo Review. I think when I was a little <laughs> kid, he right. it was like an education, mm -hmm. I don't know, educational, entertaining kids show. And then he was the original wheel of a host, I think. So Love yes, Connection was. was like the third, Love Connection was like the good guy going going dirty. You were you were hosting a kid's show. Now you're hosting now you're talking about making whoopee. Oh wait, that's yeah. okay, Judge Alex, what are you gonna say? No, I was just gonna say that uh yeah, I agree. It's a it's a great reference. It has not aged especially well, not just because love connection is not really a thing anymore, but also because um Chuck Woolery is a uh uh Twitter garbage fire. Um but uh <laughs> you heard it here ninth. But it's uh but I'm not gonna deduct points for that because it actually um uh, it also speaks to what Michael was saying before about their tendency for sort of near rhymes, bizarre and moi, foolery, woolery. They're, it's close enough. But I think also it's like, usually I'm a stickler for stuff like that. Definitely less so uh, in terms of hip hop, where a lot of the lyricism just comes from how words feel together. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's definitely about creating a, a mood as well as, as well as, uh, as as a specific text but i feel like also one of the great things about the bc boys is there's this real sense of don't overthink it like not just as a listener but as they were creating it like I, I, where did they did they start with this trio of toms and then the only thing that they could come up with to rhyme with foolery was woolery did they start with we got to put chuck woolery into a song and the only thing and then they reverse engineered it from there. I'm already overthinking it, so I'm going against <laughs> what I was saying. But I feel like there's a real stick and move quality to their to their lyricism and to their flow. That it's like you get you get the the recognition laugh on Chuck Woolery, and already you're just moving along. Mm -hmm. I always I think about that a lot with music and how things are written and how things come together. I'm always surprised that so much music, um, at least in like kind of a rock sort of um, uh, side of things starts with like the music first and then they add lyrics to it which is totally anathema of how I would imagine writing mm -hmm. a song I would imagine writing it as like a piece of poetry and then you find the right music that goes along to it and um, it's always interesting to me like oh I've, I've written this I've written this thing on the guitar and it's like oh I can write lyrics to that and I, that seems weird to me and I always think about um, when I think about like strange funny weird lyrics or whatever I think about like uh uh, what, what's the uh, da, 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 the um, the rap trio, the comedy rap trio with Adam Sandberg and oh, Lonely Island. Lonely Island. Lonely Island. Lonely Island. Thank you. And they have a song uh, that uh, features the lyric uh, "boiled goose." <laughs> and I'm convinced that the entire thing was written just because, like Andy Sandberg, thought it was funny to sing the word "boiled goose," and they wrote the song about about. Um, Oh, it's called Boombox. This one with uh, Julian Casablancas from The Strokes, and it's like this song about getting together and uh, this boombox. A boombox can change the world, but like the sting on every like the end of everything is all about 
somebody eating boiled goose. And I just think, oh, they just sometimes just, you're so fixated on something being so funny that the seriousness of everything is like deflated at the end. But I have no idea because I've never talked to the guy, but I imagine that the Beastie Boys being such funny people in their lyrics probably have that sort of sense too, where like, oh, this is just going to be funny. This is going to be a funny mm -hmm. thing that we put into this, whatever it is, and it goes from there. And, and that's and that's actually, like, that's a perfect example of, and one of the things that makes Lonely Island so funny is that they do have these songs that especially feel like, what if the Beastie Boys couldn't, what if they wrote a lyric that they couldn't move past in a song? Mm -hmm. What if, uh, you know, what if, what if Hey Ladies mentions Chuck Woolery on line six and then can't get away from him. Like, like yeah. the whole rest of the song <laughs> winds up being obsessed about Chuck, uh, obsessed by Chuck Woolery. I, it might've worked as a BC boys song. It definitely is like the bread and butter for lonely Island. <laughs> All right. Uh, Richard. Uh, bring Michael. On. Shit. Sorry guys. Sorry. Who, who's, who's boiled goose then? No, no, no. That was just a, that, that was, was, that was commentary. Thing. Oh, Okay, commentary. All right, all right. Late on us. Uh, my final choice is the reference to Ma Bell in a couple of different songs uh, from uh, the album Ill Communication, from not only the song Ill Communication, but from the song um, uh, Sure Shot. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. It was Sure Shot and uh, Get It Together, which featured uh, Q Tip um, also doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, but it's one of those like super outdated references to the old telephone. Was it AT&T and Pac mm -hmm. Bell or all the different uh, uh, the references to this uh, conglomerate of, of telephone companies that don't exist anymore that like were so prevalent back when mm -hmm. the music was written but even by then that was such an old reference that you had to have lived through and I think um, these pop culture references I think Richard you really started it off talking about how so much of their music was references to things that happened in like the seventies and their in the eighties. And certainly this is something that anyone born after the year 2000 would have to research and look up and understand what Ma Bell is to even know how it relates to anything. And like, um, obviously it was a telephone company. So there's this direct connection to, um, you know, the, name the album, uh, you know, um, ill communication and all this stuff. But like, I don't know. I, I find those things like I, uh, I imagine it was something that was just like, um, like you think about the band, like, uh, or the song, uh, rock and Robin. It was a song that referred to other bands that had birds in the title of like, <laughs> like all these <laughs> bands that were coming out in like the late fifties and early sixties were like the Orioles and all these mm. other things. And it was a song about the, Hey, I'm, I'm just as good as them. Uh, and I think that's so interesting when that happens, when it's something that's so specific um, that you that kind of will eventually kind of lose its meaning because it just doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. It's almost like a sample itself. It seems like it has, the, it adds the same amount of texture as a, a scratch Perry, you know, sample or something. It, it doesn't have as much meaning as some of the other lyrics. So it just becomes a cool noise that we hear. And I, uh, uh, I love this one. Uh, it, it's a, it's a great reference. It's two amazing songs on an amazing album. Um, my dog's name is Mabel, M-A-B-E-L. So when, when we first got her and announced, uh, to social media at large, this is our dog. Her name's Mabel. I had at least one person respond that she had the ill communication. And I was like, I hadn't even thought about that angle, but I'll take it. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, you know, Ma Bell, I think of AT&T after the when the patents on the telephone were expiring, the government awarded uh, American Telephone and Telegraph Company, essentially a government approved um, monopoly on telephone communications throughout the United States. So it was very unusual in the history of corporate America for this thing to be essentially approved. So if it, when I grew up, when I was a kid, if we wanted a telephone, you had to go to Ma Bell and basically like mm -hmm. hand over your, your whole paycheck and get a mm -hmm. phone. You check, like checked him out. Like it was, it was, it was like, I don't know. I had nothing else to compare it to. Um, 
it was a big deal <laughs> to get it a was... phone. And if you didn't pay your phone bill, it was, sh it was shut down very quickly. So yeah, it was, it was a uh, very draconian back in the day. So uh, we're about to go into Richard's fourth. fourth? Yes. And before we uh, do, before we do <laughs> warnings to judge uh, Alex Gradette after this, you are going to have to choose your four and let us know what they are. And so uh, you, you be ready. So I'm sorry, Richard, go for it. Yeah. So, uh, in doing the research for this episode, not only did I come across the uh, AV Club article that uh, that Alex referenced, I also came across a MeTV blog article um, that was a complete illustrated guide to all 107 classic TV references in Beastie Boys lyrics. Ooh, fun. And this immediately made me feel just ridiculously old. <laughs> the fact that me tv is now the target i'm now the target audience for a me tv yeah. listicle yeah did not make me feel great it's kind of like when the aarp starts sending stuff out out and it's like an interview with bob mold it's like wait yeah a i'm billy corgan for the wait yeah. a second Damn huh? <laughs> but then i then i then i then i remembered that me tv had a uh, kolchak the night stalker on then it made me want to watch kolchak the night stalker and then i felt better <laughs> about mm -hmm. it, about the whole thing so the the ref one of the references classic tv reference that i wanted to bring up and it's a real simple one but it's just from past the mic and it's just like jimmy walker i'm dynamite that's awesome that's uh, a great one. jimmy walker is again someone i think he was referenced multiple times in bc boys songs uh for people who were too young to remember him he was the breakout star from the the hit 70s uh sitcom good times and that was his catchphrase was dynamite and they referenced they they use that clip in the song past the mic so they use that as a as a as a sample and i just i've always been fascinated with jimmy walker partially because of his place in not just television history but also stand up history because people i think people don't a lot of people don't re remember or know that he was a big stand-up comedian as well as being a TV star, but he didn't write a lot of his material. And like, like the people who he hired to write for him were like literally David Letterman and Jay Leno were two of the writers for Jimmy Walker when he was a stand-up comedian. He so was their first agent at some point. I think Jimmy Walker was Leno's first agent or, or manager or something uh, even in addition. Yeah, to that, there's yeah. Some, something like that. Yeah. And so there's a real kind of there's a real kind of hipness to Jimmy Walker, even though now he's kind of I don't know if he's a punchline on by himself at this point, but he's kind of a caricature of himself. You know, when you hear Jimmy Walker, all you think of is dynamite. And I think uh, there's a great interview. I think Jimmy Walker was interviewed by Marin, in which he tells it, he kind of full, falls into almost the reluctant. Um, catchphrase 70s megastar um, mm -hmm. and that uh, Norman Lear told him gave him a script for good time said you're hired be in LA like two weeks from now for rehearsal Walker doesn't show up <laughs> for rehearsal <laughs> Lear calls him in in uh, New York and says where are you and he says I thought you were he says that 20 people have handed me scripts this week I, I didn't think you were serious <laughs> and so he finally shows up a week after that and then that whole dynamite stuff he said that uh, they were trying to make him the Fonzie of good times. And right. so after Esther Roll and John Amos and everybody would leave, uh, they would roll tape on Jimmy Walker, like just turn into the camera and saying, dynamite <laughs> in a bunch of like totally out of context. Uh, and he hadn't done that in, in the, the live taping or anything like that. But they, because Esther Roll and John Amos, all these people were worried that he would take the show from them. Like, like Fonzie did for, for happy days. So, uh, so yeah, here's the guy who we kind of saw as this, I don't know, the punch, you know, a, a catchphrase comic, but mm -hmm. um, he was kind of reluctantly. So yeah, that's a fun. Yeah. Line. And, 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 and if you were, you know, the BC boys age, if you're watching good times, either, you know, as it aired or recently on reruns and syndication, mm -hmm. you know, Jimmy Walker was cool as shit. Yeah. That's like that's the reference point that they're coming from with it, but also 
in by the time the 90s roll around and they actually make the reference he is this sort of like you said kind of pun kind of like punchline comic sort yeah. of catchphrase comic i should say sort of sort of thing so it winds up having multiple meanings yeah. to reference so it just just from a, a very simple I, like jimmy walker i'm dynamite it can get very sort of multi-layered and and cool yeah awesome all right so i do not envy your job here uh, mr gradette but you have to do it nonetheless and that is to choose uh four of the really cool references that these guys have laid out there mm -hmm. and let us know mm -hmm. what they are and i will try to type them on the screen uh do you think you want some more time to make up your choice or because uh, it, no i th okay. i believe you've been more than fair okay. uh, in terms of time and i've certainly been able to mull on these it, okay. as if i wasn't doing it for 30 years before today <laughs> All right. uh Oh, wait, no, actually, no, I, I didn't realize you meant take it, actually, actually take it down. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Okay. So I am going to say of the ones that are making the, or that are making the final Mount Rushmore here, uh, I am, uh, Jimmy Walker, I'm dynamite. Call it recency bias if you have to, but it it's a, it's a perfect reference. It's a slam dunk. It goes, it's, it stays right up there. Massive points. <laughs> Uh, pinch on the neck from Mr. Spock. Like I told you, I have spent an inordinate amount of time in my life, uh, thinking about it. Is it lyrically of the same sort of form, if not con and virtually content as Jimmy Walker? Yes, but <laughs> nobody did that as well as the DC boys. And, uh, and, uh, so I think they both deserve recognition. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna collapse them into one thing. Um, Although on the side, I was kind of musing to myself, the, the, the one deep, I guess maybe my next deep dive on this stuff will be how often they use the expression like I was to set up uh, a simile because <laughs> plug me in just like I was Eddie Harris, uh, um, uh, got mad hits like I was Rod Carew, like, like I was is in there a whole lot. Um, and uh, and I'd be curious to get the head count on that, but I'll work that out on my own time. I'm not going to make it your guys' problem. So, okay, so we've got Jimmy Walker and Mr. Spock so far. Um, I am not a big sports guy, but I got to give credit to the sports references, your, Rod Karu, your Rod's Karu and Yasada Haru's O, because as not being a big sports guy, it felt like if I could quote, uh, if I could quote BC Boys lyrics, then I could skate on those as <laughs> as meeting my sports reference quota, um, you know, or just just to interject them into a conversation, be like, oh yeah, like Rod Carew. Um, uh, so that's so that's in there too. Um, and then mm, now it gets really tough because there's only the one slot left. Uh, you can I award it yourself. You can award it to yourself. <laughs> You know what? Here's what we're here's what we're gonna do. Uh, I am gonna I'm 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 flipping the script, changing the game, folks, and I'm bringing into this a reference that I think belongs in the Mount Rushmore. Has not come up till prior to now. We've come close in some ways, but this one is so specific that I got to go with it. We were talking about the regional references, particularly White Castle, which was sort of the best example. But there is a lot of Beastie Boys material that defies the um, defies the age old adage of uh, local references get local work. There is a lot of local late night New York TV and New York culture in general reference in their lyrics that you're not going to get if you're outside of the five boroughs. But that never stopped them anyway, because they never stopped being hometown boys, even when they were working over in um, over by where friend of the pod Scott Jones used to live. Uh, over in Atwater. Uh, Cookie Puss is very close. That is that is a solid guess, but that's not where I'm going with that one. Uh, Cookie Puss, of course, the title of their disco punk breakout single. Um, no, I'm going with Ernie Anastos, who is referenced on Finger Licking Good on Check Your Head. Ernie Anastos is, uh, was a news anchor in New York, and uh, it's one of those names where... Um, if you lived in New York, you just you just knew him. He was he was uh, he was a longtime TV anchor, and this is where it gets really great. Uh, 
Check Your Head comes out in 1992. Finger Licking Good is on there. It's it's uh, an incredible song with a great sample of the Fifth Dimensions cover of Aquarius. Uh, um, all fantastic stuff. But 17 years later, in 2009, Ernie Anastos has a hot mic incident of his own. Uh, <laughs> speaking of speaking of hot mics with the um, Buddy Riches and William Shatner's of the world. Where he was, he was handing the story back. He 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 had just wrapped up a story uh, uh, on air, um, and he's passing it back to the other anchor, uh, passing the mic, if you will. And for whatever reason, you know, he says, "Now back to you, Sarah, or whomever it was." And then for ever, for whatever reason, while on air, then continue to say, "Keep fucking that chicken." <laughs> and it became instant immediate like like the video clip is out there i'll find a link to it for you guys to include in the show notes because it is just it's like it, it's it, it it's like ron burgundy but intentional like it really feels like it feels like anchorman should have based a gag on that but this came out five, this happened five years after anchorman Ernie and Astor said, keep fucking that chicken. Now, what I love about that, not about specifically the act of fucking a chicken and whatever that means, but the song is called Finger Lickin' Good. The song that referenced him nearly two <laughs> decades before this hot mic debacle on the TV news is a reference to fried chicken. I mean, it's I, I, like, if it turned out that the, the Beastie Boys actually were like, at like an Uatu the Watcher type like council, <laughs> like tying reality together. Not only does that fit my worldview really conveniently, but like, would would you really be that surprised? <laughs> All right. Well, that's uh, it looks like it's two for Richard, one for Michael. I think in that yeah, in that in it, well, and one for Alex. So um, uh, I want to thank uh, so much, uh, Alex, our guest uh, judge here, for coming in and doing uh, doing a better job than I certainly would have done on this. So thank you so much. And I want to encourage um, anybody who uh, likes cool music to go out and uh, check out the uh, the Steel Ape Sessions. I think I got the graphic here. There's the website, uh, Steel Ape that Sessions. Is correct. And uh, it's curated music mixtapes from weeks and years and eight years. Eight years is what we said. Yeah. Uh, monthly mixtapes guaranteed. I started in, it was something I heard Cameron Crowe used to do. Um, and I was like, I, and I was always fought like a couple times a year, make myself a mixtape. And I was like, wonder if I'm up to the challenge. And I have, I have duplicated some months. Some months have had multiples, but I have never missed a month since, um, uh, since January of 2015. That's really cool. So that's steelapesessions.com. And then a podcast uh, of your favorite movie. What is it again? TBD. My TBD. favorite movie of all time. It's coming soon wherever you get podcasts. Sweet. Thank you guys for coming to find me. This was a this was a trip. This was fantastic. My my only regret is that we didn't um, like all say the same word at the end of everybody's sentence all at the same time. Time. <laughs> you know, well. Well, this has been awesome. A great way to reconnect. Uh, hopefully, if all is going well, my our theme music is coming in. I don't know if it is or not. Do you hear it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, this has been the Mount Rushmore Podcast. Uh, uh, I am always Jeff. I'm Richard. I'm Michael. <laughs> oh, I'm Alex. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I'm going to hit end recording.